Next, we move into the 18th century with flintlock muskets and rifles. And what you're going to notice is a dramatic change in the weaponry going from matchlocks to flintlocks. Loading process has now become much more streamlined. Our 18th century demonstrations will include a close-up of the flintlock musket firing from Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, Florida, a demonstration of the 1764 Manual of Arms thanks to our own Ranger Jason Howell, a demonstration of the military drill from Cowpens National Battlefield in South Carolina, and we'll conclude with a demonstration of the flintlock rifle thanks to our friends at George Rogers Clark National Historical Park in Indiana. Take it away. Man outdoors, sunshine, wearing blue and red, holding musket up close. Recover your man with Follow. beard outdoors wearing red holding musket. Handle your cartridge. Pride. Shut your hand. Charge with your cartridge. Withdraw your rammer. Ram down your cut. Return your rammer. Poise your follow. Cut your follow. Present. Man outside, wearing gray, sunshine, holding and firing musket. Good morning at George Rogers Clark National Historical Park, Vincennes, Indiana. So we want to give everybody a chance to talk about the American Long Rifle, why it's so important to the George Rogers Clark story. Uh, these are these are troops, in a way, like Washington's Army, but that's the regular army. This is the irregular army. Uh, the term we use a lot today is the militia, the informal army. Today, our National Guard really fills a lot of this role. These guys were hunters, trappers. Back east, it may have been more people that worked in the butcher shop, the, uh, the merchants, the shipbuilders, things like that that were brought into service. Uh, so these are a different class of people. They grow up with the long rifle. Uh, it is different in the musket. The most distinct thing is the tubing. A smooth bore is much like an open pipe, and that's what most of the muskets of this era are. Uh, but here in the West, they have to rely on something that can give a better shot, and that is the long rifle. These are sometimes called Kentucky long rifles, rifles Pennsylvania long rifles, uh, but they get their origin from Germany, and it's the German immigrants who are coming to Pennsylvania who are producing these and such uh, more, more frequently. We do see them used some in the American Revolution in the East, 
Uh, but here in the West, they are, they're the weapon of choice. Uh, bear, buffalo, things like that don't really line up. So the first thing we want to do is make sure the gun is empty. So we have a safe talk because an empty gun is going to be a safer gun. So no rounds in there. So as I'm kind of throwing this thing around talking about the mechanics of it, we won't worry about anything going off until we're actually ready for it. So, gun parts, as with a regular musket, three parts. Lock, stock, and the barrel, which is, of course, the end, the muzzle. And people often say muzzle loader. This is technically a muzzle loader because we are going to do everything at the end of the gun, uh, the part of the gun we want to respect. With these old locks, this is uh, before the percussion caps that you see so much in the Civil War, we have a flint lock, flint and steel, Ask your kids who play Minecraft if they know flint and steel, because this is uh, this is the fire starter of choice, and it's a big advancement in what was used before, uh, which sometimes we're having pieces of match lock. But uh, this creates a spark right here in the lock. We'll pour a little powder in the pan. If everything is successful, that lights off to a little fit hole that goes to the back of the gun. This lights off the powder and pushes the bulb down the, down the field. Now with a smooth bore, that's going to rattle around. It's a loose ball. Think of sticking a marble down a tube. But with the rifle, the grooves inside the gun are actually going to spin the ball out, which make it a lot more direct. The trade-off is that they're slower to load. So you may get one shot a minute, but you can shoot as much as 200 yards with these things. Somebody that's trained, that's grown up with them, that uses them every day. The muskets that the British and most of the Eastern troops, regular army are using, those really effective range only at about 80 yards. So we, as much as we like to make fun of them for lining up shoulder to shoulder and shooting at each other, that was the most effective technique for guns that could only shoot that far. The better army was the one that could get more lead in the air. And if Clark had met the British army out in the open, it would have been very different. So things that can go wrong, uh, if your flint's worn out, we have a failure to spark. Um, the other misfire would be what we call a flash in the pan. Of course, a saying that we have today, it was just a flash in the pan, all spark, no boom. Uh, that means the vent hole has been plugged up in some way. It won't, uh, won't actually produce that flame. So, uh, let's get into sayings just a little bit. Uh, and again, you've probably heard these if you've done enough rifle programs. Flash in the pan, of course, is one. Keep your powder dry. Though we're at a half cock and there's actually a full cock motion for the gun. Guns like people should never go off half cocked. If it does go off, it's not a safe gun to use for a demonstration. And we actually have some of the springs and everything inside that aren't quite making contact. So why is this gun important to the Clark story? When Clark marched through the water and came to Vincennes, they went over 100 yards out, out of the effective range of the British who were inside Fort Sackville. They were able to fire into the fort, which Hamilton, the British commander, once described as having stockade so wide apart you could stick your fist through them. So they were actually able to shoot into the fort, and every time the portholes would open up, to push the cannons, the little three pound cannons out, they would immediately fire into those portholes and keep the cannons out of the fight, which kept the British pinned down. So the use of the rifle in this battle is very, very effective. This is one of those rare instances where the American long rifle affects the outcome of the battle. If the British were able to use those cannons, it would have changed things. If the British had caught Clark and his men in the open, woods, it would have been a very different battle. The British Army is very, very dangerous because they are so well trained and they are able to get lead in the air at such a fast rate. So, before I fire this thing off, we're just going to go through the motions real slow. Uh, so basically, we'll talk a little bit about what I have on. have my hunter's frock. My hat is the same as the tricorn, but we've actually cut it away to have a wide brim, give us a little extra protection. Um, the powder horn, I get kids occasionally that see this horn and they've seen some of the 
some of the Lord of the Rings films and they think it's to blow in, but this is actually how I'm storing my powder. Again, keep that powder dry. Uh, this is one way to do it is with the powder horn. If I were really, really good at this and did this every day and it was how I was going to put dinner on the table, I could probably eyeball an animal, pour out the right amount of powder. I'm not that good at this. I don't do it every single day. So I'm going to use a smaller horn to actually measure out my powder. So when I put the rounds in, we are going to use a bullet block right here. And these are, again, no ball, but if I had a solid round ball, it would be in there. It would be wrapped in cloth or leather that's been greased down by some bear oil. And you use this to stick it down. You're gonna see me do all this in just a moment. And then you use your rammer as I did earlier when I cleaned the gun and you're actually gonna ram everything to the back of the gun. If it goes halfway through the gun, the powder doesn't reach the end of the gun, it will not fire. So I think we point to all the accoutrements. You have your shot pouch right here. You have your powder horn. These are the important things. So safety first. We are going to put our ears <coughs> in coverage. Let's go ahead and go through the loading process. Got powder. And this again would be the ball, but no ball today. minimize the amount of time that my fingers are in front of that muzzle. So even though there's no round in here, there's still a lot of danger with the powder itself. That's why we always watch our distances. Okay. Give another check. Oh, hiker's gone? Yeah. All right. We're gonna do a prime. Now this pan actually makes a bit, this little horseshoe shaped pan gives us a place to pour. turn take a couple steps the thing I want you to listen for especially if I had a ball but there's more of a crack noise to this gun rather than the boom of a musket and a lot of that is for that ball just being seated in there just tightly whereas again that round ball of a musket would kind of bang around as it goes out so here we go 